Thanks very much uh, for the kind introduction, uh, Levi. Uh, I hope as an American, I'm not going to disappoint you by not having PowerPoint. But I actually, the older I get, the more of an aversion I develop to it. And um, you know, something as august as a public address, I think, deserves to have a, an actual paper that's been written out. And, that, and in point of fact, I think it's easier to follow someone provided they read with sufficient brio, which I hope I will do. So, as I said, this is uh, not a PowerPoint presentation, but an actual uh, paper. Light up the fire on the flowing crowd. Pour grenades on the crusader's head. Don't have mercy until he's broken. This was the encrypted message that a Moroccan-born ISIS operative in Italy received from his commanders in the Middle East via, what, via WhatsApp. Although the Italian authorities were able to thwart the series of attacks planned for their country, their French, Belgian, Turkish, German, Swedish, British, Spanish, and American counterparts have been tragically less successful in preventing the succession of bloody ISIS-inspired or directed incidents that have convulsed Europe and to a lesser degree the United States since 2015. Indeed, according to one compilation, ISIS to date has carried out more than 500 attacks in over two dozen countries that excluding the carnage in Syria and Iraq have claimed the lives of more than 2,000 persons. There was a time not so long ago when the conventional wisdom was that ISIS's violence would somehow remain confined to the perennially volatile and bloody Levant in Iraq. That wishful thinking was swept aside on November 13, 2015 by the biggest terrorist attacks on a Western city in over a decade. With no advance warning and in defiance of the prevailing analytical assumption that ISIS wasn't even interested in mounting external operations and indeed lacked the capability to do so, six simultaneous attacks killed 130 persons and wounded nearly 400 others. Just two weeks earlier, the group was similarly able to perpetrate the single most significant attack against, a commer against commercial aviation in over a decade. A bomb placed on a Russian charter flight exploded shortly after departing Sharm el Sheikh, killing all 224 persons on board. The fact that ISIS again posed a salient threat to Europe's security last year for a second summer in a row should make us all very circumspect about any conception we may have of fully understanding ISIS's capabilities and intentions much less the threat it will continue to pose following the defeats in Mosul and Raqqa and the physical destruction of its caliphate. As New York Times reporter Rukmini Kalamaki presciently noted in connection with her recent revealing account of ISIS's governance of its caliphate through an effective combination of brutality and bureaucracy, we have a long history of under underestimating groups like ISIS, she wrote. If history is a guide, we should expect that the organization will both rebound and metastasize. We're not fighting a bunch of guys in a cave. Because of ISIS's lamentable persistence and Al-Qaeda's stubborn resilience, today we arguably face the most perilous security environment since the period immediately following the September 11, 2001 attacks, with serious threats emanating from not one, but two terrorist movements who both have cultivated a myriad of branches and affiliates, thus enhancing their capabilities and ensuring their longevity. Meanwhile, as US Secretary of Defense James Mattis announced this past January, Great power competition, not terrorism, is now the focus of US national security. Thus ensuring that America, at least, will henceforth, henceforth have to do more with fewer resources
to effectively counter the threats that bo both ISIS and Al-Qaeda continue to pose. ISIS, alas, is here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. Some two years before the 2015 Paris attacks, ISIS had built an external operations network in Europe that mostly escaped notice. Known as the Amin al karji or simply as Enmi or Omni, the respective Turkish and Arabic rendering of the word Omniat or security service, this unit appears to function independently of the group's shattered military and territorial fortunes. For instance, US intelligence and defense officials have publicly stated their belief that as of August 2016, ISIS had already sent hundreds of operatives into the European Union, with hundreds more having been dispatched to Turkey. This investment of operational personnel ensures that ISIS will retain an, an international terrorist strike capability on some level, irrespective of its battlefield defeats in Syria and Iraq. Indeed, ISIS's external operations and intelligence units proved critical in facilitating the transfer of hundreds of ISIS commanders from Syria to Europe, the Sudan, the Sahel, among other places, before Raqqa fell. Already in September 2016, ISIS's leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, had instructed potential foreign fighters who were unable to travel to the caliphate to instead emigrate to other vilayets where ISIS branches are located. This suggests that these other branches will develop their own external operations capabilities independent of the parent organization and themselves pre present future threats. Much as Al-Qaeda's franchises have over the past decade in Yemen, North Africa, and South Asia, among other places. The involvement of ISIS's Libyan branch in last May's horrific bombing of a Manchester concert venue points to the realization of al-Baghdadi's diktat. According to the US National Counterterrorism Center, ISIS has established at least 18 such branches throughout the world, most recently in the Philippines, Afghanistan, and reportedly even in Indonesia. Moreover, in addition to the presumed sleeper cells that ISIS has seeded throughout Europe, there is the further problem of at least some of the estimated 7,000 European foreign fighters returning home. They are only a fraction of the nearly 4,000 persons from more than 120 different countries throughout the world who trained in Syria and Iraq. What this means is in little more than four years, ISIS's international cadre surpassed even the most liberal estimates of the number of foreign fighters that the US intelligence community believes journeyed to Afghanistan during the 1980s and 1990s in order to join Al Qaeda. In other words, far more foreign nationals have been trained by ISIS in Syria and Iraq during the past couple of years than were by Al Qaeda in the dozen or so years leading up to the September 11, 2001 attacks. That figure, in fact, is also about eight times the number of foreign fighters who fought in Iraq during the period following the 2003 invasion and preceding the 2007 surge. Although no completely accurate figures are available, an authoritative accounting of foreign fighter numbers prepared by researchers at the US National Defense University reveals the current dimensions of this threat. According to their analysis, no more than 7,000 foreign fighters were actually killed in Syria and Iraq, and some 15,000 were able to flee. About half that number returned to their home countries, where perhaps only a third, about 6,000 persons, have either been imprisoned or in any way actively monitored. There is also the not inconsiderable problem of unaccounted foreign fighters deported to third countries whose whereabouts are now completely unknown. Turkey, for instance, deported about 5,000 foreign fighters, 
the vast majority of whom have simply disappeared. The challenges that Britain faces with its own foreign fighter cadre illustrates this ongoing threat. About 400 of the 800 Britons who left to join ISIS in the Levant in Iraq have returned. Of that number, fewer than a quarter have been imprisoned. Meanwhile, the UK has canceled or revoked the passports of 150 persons whose whereabouts remain unknown, while Turkey reports that it has deported at least 100 British citizens to third countries who've moved, whose movements remain similarly opaque. The result is a disturbingly hard core of foreign fighters whose movements are completely unaccounted for. The recent trial in Denmark of a former foreign fighter who is alleged to have ties to the ISIS cell responsible for the May 2017 Manchester attack underscores the challenges that security and intelligence services and law enforcement agencies face in tracking these individuals. This person is of Somali heritage. He lived in Britain, held a Finnish passport, went off to fight with ISIS in Syria, but then was erected, arrested in Denmark on terrorism-related charges. And unlike the comparatively narrow geographical demographics of prior Al-Qaeda recruits, ISIS's foreign fighters cadre includes hitherto unrepresented nationalities, such as hundreds of Latin Americans, along with citizens from Mali, Benin, Bangladesh, and the small Caribbean island state of Trinidad and Tobago, among other atypical jihadi recruiting grounds. Meanwhile, the danger from so-called lone wolf attacks also remains. The late ISIS commander Abu Muhammad al-Adnani's famous September 2014 summons to battle has hitherto proven far more compelling than al-Qaeda's long-standing efforts similarly to animate, motivate, and inspire individuals to engage in violence in support of its aims. Exactly 16 years ago, for example, al-Qaeda's current leader and then number two, Ayman al-Zawahiri, issued a similar call in his treatise titled Knights Under the Prophet's Banner. Published in a London-based Arabic language newspaper, it explains, and I'm quoting, tracking down Americans and the Jews is not impossible. Killing them with a single bullet, a stab, or a device made up of a popular mix of explosives, or hitting them with an iron rod is not impossible. Burning down their property with Molotov cocktails is not difficult. With the available means, he concluded, small groups could prove to be a frightening horror for the Americans and for the Jews. But al-Zawahiri was using an anachronistic media platform that was in the process of being rendered irrelevant by more immediate and pervasive 21st century technology. And his print message in an obscure newspaper consequently was seen by few and ignored by most. By comparison, Al-Adnani's plea quickly snowballed and has continued to gather momentum since. If you are not able to find an IED or a bullet, Al-Adnani memorably declared, then single out the disbelieving American, Frenchman, or any of their allies. Smash his head with a rock, or slaughter him with a knife, or run him over with your car, or throw him down from a high place, or choke him, or poison him. Indeed, despite Al-Adnani's 2016 death, his words still resonate, given the cumulative power of the internet and social media, reaching a far larger audience, both faster and more effectively, and creating, therefore, a self-sustaining echo chamber that al-Zawahiri could never have achieved much less even imagined in 2001. Utilizing a variety of freely available social media plat networking platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Flickr among others, terrorist and insurgent groups today have thus introduced an even more direct and personally intimate form of messaging. ISIS has positioned itself at the forefront of this new revolution 
in terrorist communications. Indeed, since 2014, it has produced and disseminated a succession of increasingly more heinous and grisly propaganda videos of brutal executions and similar depredations that have captured the attention of a new generation of terrorist recruits. These videos and their unrestrained exaltation of violence have, attra have attracted many more viewers than Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri's comparatively priggish presentations recanting complex theological treatises or imparting didactic philosophical and historical lectures. Where Al-Qaeda and its affiliates saw the internet as a place to disseminate material anonymously or meet in dark spaces, Robert Hannigan, the former director of the UK government communications headquarters notes, ISIS has embraced the web as a noisy channel in which to promote itself, intimidate people, and radicalize new recruits. ISIS has thus been remarkably effective in its use of these social media to speak to a global audience, thereby completely bypassing and thwarting the traditional media from misinterpreting or otherwise distorting its core message. A common ISIS propaganda mantra, accordingly, is don't hear about us, hear from us. These social media platforms facilitate both ubiquitous and real-time communication between like-minded radicals with would-be recruits and potential benefactors, the phenomena known as narrowcasting. Also called niche marketing or target marketing, Gabby Weiman, the renowned Israeli terrorist communications expert, explains, narrowcasting aims media messages at specific segments of the public defined by characteristics such as values, preferences, demographic attributes, or location. Ease, interactivity, networking, reach, frequency, usability, stability, immediacy, publicity, and permanence are among the benefits to terrorist groups like ISIS who have nimbly adapted these technologies for their nefarious purposes. I don't think it is far-fetched to say an unnamed American intelligence official commented in a May 26 article detailing ISIS's mastery of digital media and technology that the internet is a major reason why ISIS is so successful and so worrying. ISIS's foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq, for instance, individually amass thousands of followers on platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. They communicated with their audiences often on a daily basis and sometimes multiple times each day, providing firsthand immediate accounts of heroic battles and more mundane daily activities, making jihad accessible and comprehensible on a uniquely intimate and personal basis. These fighters effectively invited motivated, animate, and essentially summoned their digital media followers and friends and other online contacts to come to Syria and Iraq and partake of the holy war against the apostate regimes of Bashar al-Assad and Haider al-Abadi. Blatant sectarian messages coupled with div divinely ordained clarion calls to resist Persian domination and decisively affect the outcome of the eternal struggle between the Shia and the Sunni, and between the Sunni and the Shia and the latter's Alawite satraps, provide additionally compelling incentives. Indeed, a 2014 ISIS recruitment video circulated via social media featured heavily armed militants with distinctive British and Australian accents, trumpeting the virtues of jihad and the ineluctable religious imperative of joining the caravan of martyrs. Through these voices, the group has been able to tailor its messages to, to specific audiences back in these fighters' own neighborhoods, schools, clubs, community centers, and places of worship. Whereas the older versions of terrorist websites effectively were waiting for visitors to arrive, Weiman argues, 
A social networking approach allows terrorists to reach their target audience and virtually knock on their doors. ISIS's unbridled visual depictions of particularly gruesome executions and other wanton acts of violence continue to galvanize the attention of the select audience and beseech them to join ISIS's struggle. A new generation of celebrity fighters, accordingly, has been created to facilitate this process. Ultraviolence, as Jessica, Jessica Stern and J.M. Berger term this phenomena, sold well with the target demographic of foreign fighters, angry, maladjusted young men whose blood stirred at images of grisly beheadings and the crucifixion of so-called apostates. Other types of appeals, utilizing more traditional messages intended for, for more mainline religious audiences, are also used by ISIS to target this entirely different demographic. Familiar historical and theological references are invoked for this audience's consideration, and specific solicitations are directed to the descendants of pious families of ancient respected lineage and stature. ISIS propagandists also portray the organization as messengers and executors of apocalyptic prophecies, promising the imminence of an inevitable clash between the forces of good and evil in an epic decisive battle as part of a compelling narrative with which to target other potential recruits. These themes both resonate with and have a very powerful effect on their intended audiences. According to the American scholar Will McCants, ISIS's eschatological arguments have infused the group with newfound momentum, producing an inrush of foreign fighters to Syria, or I should say, infused the group with newfound momentum, having produced an inrush of foreign fighters to Syria, many of them seeking a role in the end of time drama. For terrorists today, the advantages of these new social media are thus as profound as they are manifold. It is therefore also not surprising to find that all of Al-Qaeda's most important affiliates or allies, Al-Shabaab, Ansar al-Sharia, the Abdullah Azam brigades, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, the former Jabhat al-Nusra, and the Afghan Taliban have their own Twitter accounts or had their own Twitter accounts on which they regularly tweet or tweeted. In fact, during its lethal assault on Nairobi, Kenya's Westgate Shopping Center in September 2013, Al-Qaeda's Somali branch, Al-Shabaab, provided live, ongoing commentary of the attack via Twitter. In this respect, it should be noted that while ISIS has dominated the headlines and preoccupied national security officials for the past four years, Al-Qaeda has meanwhile been quietly rebuilding. Its announcement last summer of yet another affiliate, this one dedicated to the liberation of Kashmir, coupled with the resurrection of its presence in Afghanistan and the solidification of its influence in Syria, Yemen, and Somalia, underscores the resiliency and continued vitality of this protean terrorist organization. Although Al-Qaeda's rebuilding and reorganization predates the Arab Spring, it is undeniable that the upheaval and instability which followed both hastened and abetted the movement's resurgence. At the time, an unbridled optimism held that the transformative social, political, and economic developments which had swept, swept across North Africa and the Middle East had achieved what decades of terrorism had manifestly failed to deliver, supposedly marginalizing groups like Al-Qaeda forever. Social media and civil protest seemed at the time to have rendered terrorism an irrelevant anachronism in a region where it was believed the longing for democracy and economic reform had decisively trumped repression and violence. In the March 2011 issue of Inspire magazine, Al-Qaeda's titular propagandist-in-chief, Anwar al-Awlaki, cogently demolished each of those arguments. 
and I quote, the Mujahideen around the world are going through a moment of elation, and I wonder whether the West is aware of the upsurge of Mujahideen activity in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, and Morocco. Counterterrorism cooperation, Al-Qaeda, I mean, Al-Awlaki opined, or actually I would say predicted, would both slow and become inconsistent. Al-Qaeda ideologues, he hypothesized, would be able to propagandize now with impunity. And the unrest would produce new openings and new opportunities for the movement. Is the West aware of what is happening, he concluded, or are they asleep with drapes covering their eyes? The successive killings in 2011 and 2012 of Osama bin Laden, al-Awlaki himself, and Abu Yahya al-Libi lent new weight to the optimists, predicting that al-Qaeda was a spent force, an irrelevant anachronism in a changed region. But in retrospect, al-Awlaki was proven posthumously correct. Al-Qaeda, just as he foretold, was among the regional players who benefited most from the Arab Spring's tumult. The thousands of hardened Al-Qaeda prisoners feed from, freed from Egyptian jails who fled to Libya, Turkey, Syria, Yemen, and other locales endowed the movement at an opportune moment with combat expertise, leadership skills, and foot soldiers. While the military coup that subsequently toppled the democratically elected President Mohamed Morsi greatly enhanced al-Qaeda's credibility and appeal, validating Ayman al-Zawahiri's repeated admonitions about having any faith in the West and believing in the sanctity of democratic processes. The civil unrest in Syria that rapidly gave way to outright civil war also breathed new life into the movement's efforts to appear relevant and reinsert itself into the region's politics. Within weeks of bin Laden's killing, al-Zawahiri had publicly affirmed al-Qaeda's support for the uprising in Syria, as well as in Yemen and Libya. Indeed, one of his first official acts as the new al-Qaeda emir was to order a Syrian veteran of the Iraqi insurgency named Abu Mohammed al-Julani to return home and establish the al-Qaeda franchise that would eventually become Jabhat al-Nusra. And just days before his own death, a year later in a US drone strike, Alibi had called on Muslims in Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon to do everything within their power to assist in the overthrow of Syria's apostate Alawite ruling class. Taking advantage of this historical rivalry between Sunni and Shia, of which the ruling Alawites were a minority sect, Al-Qaeda's blatantly sectarian messaging sharpened these frictions and enabled the group to establish a presence in Syria, a country long heralded by Muslims as sacred territory. Referenced by both the Quran and the Hadith, for centuries, Syrian's, Syria's capital, Damascus, has been a, had been a provincial seat of the Ottoman Empire from which Islam's third holiest shrine, Jerusalem's Al-Asqa Mosque and Dome of the Rock, as well as all of present-day Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Lebanon were governed. Al-Qaeda's chosen instrument in Syria was Jabhat al-Nusra, the product of a joint initiative with its Iraqi branch, which at the time called itself the Islamic State of Iraq, or ISI. But as al-Nusra grew in both strength and impact, in 2013, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, ISI's leader, announced the forcible amalgamation of al-Nusra into a new organization to be known as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, ISIS. Al-Julani rejected the unilateral merger and appealed to al-Zawahiri for its reversal. The conflict intensified as al-Zawahiri's mediation efforts foundered, eventually prompting him to formally expel ISIS from the Al-Qaeda network, and especially bitter personal enmity between al-Baghdadi and al-Zawahiri ensued that further deepened their respective organizations' estrangement. Although ISIS has commanded much of the world's attention since then, 
al-Qaeda's comparative quiescence does not mean that it has been inactive. Instead, al-Qaeda has embarked on an ambitious strategy to protect its remaining senior leadership and and and, and unostentatiously consolidate its influence in new and existing theaters. Al-Qaeda's highest priority was to effect the safe transfer from South Asia of the movement's most important surviving senior leaders and commanders. Since 2012, Al-Qaeda has worked to ensure that the movement remains impervious to a single knockout blow of its entire senior leadership. Accordingly, these key personnel have dispersed to Syria, Iran, Turkey, Libya, and Yemen, with only a hardcore remnant still in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Advances in commercial, off-the-shelf digital communication alongside successive public revelations of US and allied intelligence services eavesdropping capabilities have enabled Al-Qaeda to utilize end-to-end encryption technology to a point where Al-Sahab, Al-Qaeda's communications department, can boast today of facilitating daily contact between al-Zawahiri with his minions in far-flung battle zones like Syria. The number of top al-Qaeda leaders dispatched to Syria over the past half dozen years or so underscores the high priority that the movement attaches to that country. Musin al-Fadli, a bin Laden intimate who until his death in a 2015 US airstrike commanded the movement's elite Ford-based operational arm in Syria known as the Khorasan Group is a case in point. Al-Fadli functioned as al-Zawahiri's personal local emissary, charged with trying to heal the rift between al-Nusra and ISIS. Haider Kirkan, a Turkish national and long-standing senior al-Qaeda operative, was sent by bin Laden himself to Turkey in 2010 to lay the groundwork for the movement's expansion into the Levant, even before the Arab Spring, created precisely that opportunity. Kirkan was responsible for facilitating the movement of other key senior Al-Qaeda personnel from Pakistan to Syria in order to escape the then escalating drone campaign ordered by President Barack Obama. He was killed in 2016 by a U- in a US bombing raid. The previous fall, however, Saif al adil had arrived in Syria. A Zelig-like figure and former Egyptian army commando, commando whose terrorism pedigree dates to the assassination plots against President Anwar Sadat of the late 1970s and early 1980s through the 1998 bombings of the US embassies in Kenya and Tanzania to al-Qaeda's post-9-11 terrorist campaigns in Saudi Arabia al adil is arguably the movement's most experienced and battle-hardened commander. Among his previous assignments was his tutor and mentor to bin Laden's presumptive heir apparent, his son Hamza, after both had fled to Iran following the US-led invasion of Afghanistan in October 2001. Indeed, with this resilient senior command structure in place, Al-Qaeda is well positioned to exploit ISIS's weakening military position and territorial losses across the region and once again claim its preeminent position at the vanguard of the violent Salafi jihadi struggle. ISIS in any event can no longer compete with Al-Qaeda in terms of influence, reach, manpower, and cohesion. In only two domains, is ISIS currently stronger than its rival? The name recognition and power of its brand, coupled with ISIS's presumed ability to mount spectacular terrorist strikes in Europe as a result of its deployment of its ex- external operations capability there. But the, but the latter, it should be noted, is a product of al zawahiris strategic decision to prohibit external operations in the West so that Al-Qaeda's own rebuilding can continue apace. The handful of aberrations to this policy, such as the 2015 Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris and the 2017 St. Petersburg Metro bombing in Russia, 
provide compelling evidence that al-Qaeda's own external operations capabilities have not completely atrophied and can be reanimated when the timing is deemed propitious. AQAP's undiminished capacity to engage in international terrorism, especially targeting commercial aviation, was cited in a detailed New York Times report last December. Accordingly, from Northwest Africa to South Asia, Al-Qaeda has in fact knitted together a global movement of some two dozen franchises. That is, it is entrenched in Libya, where groups such as Ansar al-Sharia and the Benghazi Defense Brigades, as well as the Shura Councils in Benghazi, Darna, and Sirt, advance the parent movement's interests. Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb is meanwhile active in surrounding countries, targeting Western aid workers and tourists. AQAP, long the movement's most threatening and consequential franchise, as previously noted, controls ports and highways along Yemen's coastline, ensuring itself a continuing source of revenue from smuggling that is used to co-opt local communities through the provision of goods and services that the shattered central government can no longer provide. Not surprisingly, AQAP's ranks have quadrupled in recent years. Al-Shabaab in Somalia has similarly expanded and regained lost momentum as it has beaten back attempts by ISIS to challenge Al-Qaeda's dominant position in East Africa. Together with its Taliban allies in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda has reestablished a presence in nearly half of that country's territory. The movement has made new inroads in Bangladesh in addition to its aforementioned new franchise dedicated to the liberation of Kashmir. In all, Al-Qaeda can now boast of at least 30,000 men under arms with approximately 10 to 20,000 fighters in Syria, albeit arrayed in several factions, often riven with deeply personal rivalries, 7 to 9,000 in Somalia, 5,000 in Libya, 4,000 in Yemen, a similar number dispersed throughout other countries across the Maghreb and Sahel, and about 1,000 in South Asia, according to a variety of authoritative sources. Al-Qaeda's success in resurrecting its global network is the result of three key strategic decisions taken by al-Zawahiri. The first was strengthening the movement's decentralized franchise approach that has ensured Al-Qaeda's survival since the dark days following the commencement of the US-led war on terrorism. Over the years, the leaders and deputies of Al-Qaeda's far-flung franchises have been effectively co-opted and integrated into the movement's deliberative processes. Today, Al-Qaeda is truly global, having effectively melded local concerns into an all-encompassing worldwide grand strategy that flattens any meaningful, meaningful global local differences. The same commercial advances in encryption software that enable al-Zawahiri's communications with al-Qaeda's Syrian operatives also permit the efficacious exchange of information and issuing of orders throughout the entire al-Qaeda network. The second key decision was the order given by al-Zawahiri in 2013 to avoid mass casualty operations, especially those that might kill Muslim civilians. At a time when ISIS was running rampant with one atrocity following another, all staged for maximum effect on social media, the Al-Qaeda leader's move was a brilliant strategic gambit. Al-Qaeda, accordingly, has been able to present itself paradoxically as quote unquote moderate extremists an ostensibly more palatable rival to ISIS. The fact that Al-Qaeda is just as ambitious but more patient and calculating than ISIS is thus lost to many who not only actively support and assist it but seek to partner with what they perversely regard as a more acceptable and reasonable alternative to ISIS. This development reflects al-Zawahiri's third strategic decision of letting ISIS take all the heat and absorb all the blows from the coalition arrayed against it, while Al-Qaeda unobtrusively rebuilds its military strength 
and basks in its newfound cachet as moderates in contrast to the unrestrained ISIS. Anyone inclined to be taken in by this ruse would do well to heed the admonition of Theo Podnos, the former Peter Theo Curtis, the American journalist who spent two years in Syria as a Nusra Front hostage. Padnos relates how the group's senior commanders, and here I quote, were inviting Westerners to the jihad in Syria, not so much because they needed more foot soldiers, they didn't, but because they want to teach the Westerners to take the struggle into every neighborhood and subway back home, close quote. A parallel arguably thus exists with the so-called phony war in Western Europe between September 1939 and May 1940, when there was a strange lull in serious, in serious fighting following the German invasion of Poland and the British and French declarations of war against Germany. Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain visited British forces arrayed along the Franco-Belgian border that Christmas. I don't think the Germans have any intention of attacking, do you? He asked Lieutenant General Bernard Law Montgomery, the commander of an infantry division defending the front. Montgomery, the future hero of El Alamein, brusquely replied that the Germans would attack when it suited them. It is a point worth keeping in mind as Al Qaeda busily rebuilds and marshals its forces to continue the war it declared now 22 years ago. Finally, looking to the immediate future, ISIS's continuing setbacks and serial weakening arguably create the conditions where some reconciliation with Al Qaeda might yet still be affected. Efforts to reunite have been continuous from both sides, virtually from the time of ISIS's expulsion from the Al Qaeda fold. Regardless how it might occur, any kind of reconciliation between ISIS and Al Qaeda or reamalgamation would profoundly change the current conflict and result in a significantly escalated threat of foreign fighter terrorist operations in the West. Mercifully, I'll now move to conclude. The US-led war on terrorism has now lasted longer than both world wars. It has surpassed America's prolonged military intervention in Indochina during the 1960s and 1970s, in which the Australian military also fought. And just like the Viet Cong guerrillas and People's Army of Vietnam main force units half a century ago, our Salafi jihadi enemies have today locked the West into another enervating war of attrition, the preferred strategy of terrorists and guerrillas from time immemorial. They seek to undermine national political will, corrode internal popular support, and demoralize us and our alliance partners through a prolonged, spasmodically intensifying and increasingly diffuse campaign of terrorism and violence. Most dangerously, they pursue a deliberate strategy of provocation, seeking to push our liberal democracies to embrace increasingly illiberal security solutions that compromise fundamental civil liberties demonize immigrants, threaten our core values, and thus validate the terrorist self-fulfilling clash of civilizations narrative. In his last publicly addressed videotaped statement, Bin Laden revealed precisely this strategy on the eve of the 2004 US presidential elections. So we are continuing this policy in bleeding America to the point of bankruptcy, he declared. Allah willing, and nothing is too great for Allah, this is in addition to our having experience in using guerrilla warfare and the war of attrition to fight tyrannical superpowers as we, alongside the Mujahideen, bled Russia for 10 years until it went bankrupt and was forced to withdraw in defeat. Decisively breaking this stasis and emerging from this war of attrition must therefore be among the International Counterterrorism Coalition's highest priorities. Simply killing a small number of leaders in terrorist groups whose ranks in any event are continually replenished will not end the threats posed by ISIS and Al-Qaeda 
nor dislodge them from their bases of operation in the Levant and Iraq, North, West, and East Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and South and Southeast Asia. The slow and fractured process of training indigenous government security in those, uh, in, of training indigenous government security forces in those reasons, in those regions, will not do so either. The inadequacy of these training activities and efforts to build partner capacity are evidenced by the mostly unimpeded escalation of terrorist activities in all those places. Whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Somalia, or Yemen, efforts to build partner capacity have foundered. In each, Islamist terrorist numbers grew faster than we have been able to train indigenous security forces effectively. Terrorist control over territory and the creation of new sanctuaries and safe havens has expanded while government sovereignty contracted. And the terrorist operational effectiveness has appreciably outpaced that of their government opponents. Elements of Al-Qaeda and remnants of ISIS arguably are now superior in tactics, firepower, and discipline compared with some of the conventional military forces and regional coalitions arrayed against them. While there has been some recent progress in Mali, Nigeria, Syria, and Iraq, it is not clear whether the past problems that undermine the performance of indigenous militaries have been addressed or reversed. Accordingly, a complete reevaluation and systemic overhaul of our training and resourcing of foreign partners is required if we are to prevent the further spread of ISIS and Al-Qaeda branches and counter their entrenchment across the multiple regions in which they have already embedded themselves. Today, in contrast to the unity and resolve of 17 years ago, the overall prosecution of the war on terrorism appears fractionated and self-centered. The landmark invocation of the collective self-defense provisions included in Article 5 of the NATO Charter to cite one preeminent example of this lost sense of unity seems an artifact of a long ago time given both the myriad of contemporary security concerns and profound divisions that currently beset the alliance. NATO could do much more to fight terrorists and prevent international terrorism from spreading the former Secretary General, Anders Foe Rasmussen, complained shortly after last May's bombing of the Manchester concert venue. Since NATO's command of the United Nations mandated International Security Assistance Force for Afghanistan ended in December 2014, the Alliance's active engagement in counterterrorism has been piecemeal and anemic. There is an exceedingly modest training mission in Iraq but nothing at all in either Libya or Syria, for instance, arguably the key fault lines in the struggle against terrorism. The intermittent dispatch of mobile training teams to Egypt, Jordan, Mauritania, Morocco, and Tunisia during 2016, for example, and the aerial surveillance provided by member state AWACS in support of anti-ISIS coalition operations in the Levant and Iraq encapsulates basically the extent of NATO's recent major counterterrorism operations. The creation in December 2016 of the post of Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security at NATO headquarters was a welcome and very important step forward, however belated. But with a staff of fewer than 50 persons and a remit that embraces a wide array of conventional and unconventional challenges facing the alliance, including Russia, North Korea, and intended proliferation and cyber threats, this new office's impact on the alliance's counterterrorism mission is necessarily limited and insufficient. The longstanding complaint that only five of the 28 NATO member states spend the required 2% of their GDP on defense coupled with France and Germany's resistance to any expansion of NATO's counterterrorism mandate beyond the current status quo, has severely limited the alliance's role in countering one of the preeminent contemporary threats to the alliance's collective and individual security. Instead, individual member states pursue tactics and policies 
designed to manage internal security problems, defend their own borders, and narrowly to protect their own citizens. Absent the concerted, genuinely coordinated, and holistic strategy required to better contain this scourge and effectively break the cycle of regeneration that has sustained and nourished successive iterations of Al-Qaeda and produced even more heinous terrorist manifestations such as ISIS. Forty years ago, last month, public television stations across the United States broadcast a special two-hour documentary featuring 16 international experts titled Terrorism, The World at Bay. The previous week, terrorists had struck in Israel, the Netherlands, and Italy in what then was an unprecedented show of force. The separate and uncoordinated attacks occurring in rapid succession had generated worldwide fear and alarm, as few prior incidents had. We can expect more terrorism, the host of the documentary, Jim Hogue, Ho, concluded. And we must react, he said, sometimes with bold action, other times with prudent concession. We must cooperate and plan as terrorists do and change our responses as they change their techniques. And where there are legitimate grievances, we must work to eliminate them. At all times, we must exercise caution and cunning, not bravado. Overreaction to terrorism is as much to be feared as despair, for at stake are human lives and civil liberties. We have suffered terrorism before and most likely will again. Transnational terrorists will not respect our borders, only our resolve. The more it changes, the more it's the same thing, goes Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr's famous 19th century epigram. The same may be said of our collective response to terrorism today. The current threat environment posed by the emergence and spread of ISIS and the stubborn resilience and long game approach of Al-Qaeda makes a new strategy and new organizational and institutional behaviors necessary. The non-traditional challenges posed by elusive and deadly irregular adversaries emphasizes the need to anchor changes that will more effectively close the gap between detecting irregular adversarial activity and rapidly countering it. The effectiveness of this strategy will be based on our capacity to think like a networked enemy and anticipation of how that enemy may react in a variety of situations aided by different resources. The goal requires that national security structures, both individually and collectively, organize themselves for maximum efficiency, information sharing, and the ability to function quickly and effectively under rapidly evolving new operational definitions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor Hoffman, for what I think everyone would agree was an absolute tour de force of the uh, depressing state in which we find ourselves some 17 to 18 years into the current and uh, the current fight against terrorism. Um, we've got about 10 minutes before the bar opens, um, and there's canapes too, but mostly the bar. Um, so if anyone's got questions, please, I'm sure Bruce is happy to take them. Well, it certainly hasn't stabilized the situation, but I would step back and say the main problem is that the U.S. has no overall counterterrorism strategy. 
at least that's being articulated. The last iteration of a counterterrorism strategy was in 2011. Over the past seven years, things have changed at the risk of understatement dramatically. Um, the new administration did articulate and at least draft such a strategy. It's been stuck since last April. And without an overall strategy, then the bits and pieces, as you point out, are going to be necessarily contradictory, uh, not, necess not, necessar not in any sense coordinated, and perhaps not helpful. So we still, I mean, supposedly that strategy was going to be released on the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. It didn't happen. It was then supposed to be released when the new overall national security strategy was promulgated in December. It didn't appear. So therein lies, in my view, the main problem. If you don't have the overarching principle, all the pieces are going to go awry. And that's part of the, the message, perhaps not, su not sufficiently, but what I was articulating is that that overall strategy is what's missing. Bruce, John Blackson from the ANU, thanks uh, for an excellent presentation. I'm just wondering your thoughts, you know, here in Australia, we look at uh, the challenges we face and it looks a bit different from in the US. Um, we, we're seeing the, the challenges in the Middle East as ones that have been with us virtually a generation now and it seems to be on kind of almost a autopilot. You just have to keep occasionally dousing the flames and going back to push, push it back a bit. There doesn't seem to be really any long-term plan, even one on the offing. I, don't, I mean, I don't, haven't seen the draft you speak of, but uh, if, if previous plans are any indication, they're not, they don't generate much hope. Mm. Um, here in Australia, we're mindful that <coughs> the dynamics in the Asia or Pacific or the Indo-Pacific have changed pretty dramatically since 9-11. And uh, there's a real question now about what do we do? How much do we keep bothering, fighting what seems to be a, you know, maybe a struggle for a century in the Middle East when there are growing challenges and perhaps other existential challenges closer to home to worry about? That affect the United States as well. And to just double up on the question, are we spending our treasure in, in the Middle East on a target that arguably the neighbours should be dealing with more, um, that the people who have to live with it, the, the wealthy Saudi Arabians, the Iranians, the Turks, uh, who live there, are we not trying to do it for them and generating a problem for ourselves closer to home and, and giving too much leeway and too much space for others to claim ground elsewhere. Thanks. Well, I mean, that was, you know, of course, part of the strategy that the Obama administration also embraced. Um, and it was to build up uh, indigenous capacity. It just, it just hasn't worked. And I think the problem with terrorism today, I mean, Al-Qaeda pursuing this, this global phenomenon means that threats, unfortunately, no longer remain geographically con constrained. And the problem, of course, is that, you know, you know, Terrorism, unfortunately, in the post-9-11 era, has the capacity to immediately catapult a terrorist group into prominence through a successful terrorist attack, particularly if it's spectacular. And unfortunately, the definition of a spectacular has changed since even 9-11. It doesn't have to be that grand attack on mass transit or the attack such as was prevented last summer uh, that involved Australia um, is a case in point. And then the political price that's paid and the overreaction to that incident creates almost a worse dynamic. Uh, you know, my point is that these, because these threats aren't constrained, we have to be better at addressing them and be better at avoiding exactly what I would argue is the terrorist strategy, not only of attrition but of, pro but of provocation, and of dealing with the threats, the threat of al-Qaeda particularly, when it is in this rebuilding period of quiescence, rather than as is too often happen in the past is that we respond, in many cases, exactly as the terrorists want with an overreaction that does inflame and does worsen the situation. So this is why I think a longer term strategy and a more holistic one is absolutely essential. I have to say, some, whether surprisingly or not, that draft strategy I thought was amongst the finest that I had seen produced since 9-11. Um, it was leaked to, and you can 
Google it and fire with, um, Reuters reported it last last April and it was a very, very I think coherent and logical strategy probably one of the reasons it hasn't actually been released is it lacked a lot of the rhetoric that one would have thought might have been it it was a very sober sober document but looked at this as part of an ongoing struggle and addressed the issue of how do we actually together, not with the United States doing everything, but break the cycle of recruitment and regeneration that has sustained the terrorist movements and finally bring the struggle to an end before it, before it undermines our own societies. As I said, it's, I, the author of it or, or the person responsible for it was, was Chris Costa, who um, left the National Security Council um, and retired from, for, from government service. Last January, I saw him at a conference a couple of weeks ago and asked him, and he said, it's still lost. And just undermining the stasis that we're in in the United States, the, for the first time ever, not just in memory, the three top counterterrorism positions, the director of the NCTC has been vacant since January, the president's special assistant and senior director on counterterrorism has been vacant since the end of January, uh, and um, the president's advisor on homeland security and counterterrorism has been vacant now for a month, which is almost unprecedented. So with those three positions not filled, you know, perhaps the new national security advisor sometime in the near future will fill them, but without those positions in place, there's not going to be any development or any attention paid to strategy. Um, given the failure of the uh, Obama strategy, the decapitation, uh, de-radicalization, and uh, local force uh, partnerships, and your holistic strategy makes, um, makes a lot of sense, I just wondered what part in that holistic strategy uh, the idea of, of stable, legitimate governments in those particular regions where uh, ISIS and AQ have got uh, had traction there, I mean, Libya, Syria, etc. So that does seem to be a kind of critical element of a long-term strategy. I'm just wondering if you'd say a few things about that. Well, we, in many cases, we haven't gotten the sequencing right. And um, it has to start with weakening the terrorist groups kinetically and weakening them militarily because that's in large measure of their, of their appeal is their ability to uh, seize and hold territory and to exercise some form of governance. Then having do done that, we have to have what has eluded us for the past decade and a half, the capability to recalibrate or change those environments to address whatever senses of injustice or if it's economic disparity, if it's corruption that gives rise to terrorists becoming surrogate forces, which again, we, in the past we haven't had the will and that's why we've sort of condemned, we've more or less condemned ourselves to constantly refighting the struggle. So of course, that's absolutely the essential elements, but we understand them and we know them and history has shown that to be the case. It's actually implementing them that's required and the political will to do so. I mean, I don't think our societies can fall back on, let's say, Israel's approach, what they call mowing the grass. I mean, firstly, if you read, I think, one of the great books that's, one of the, the greatest books, I have to say, too, that's been written about terrorism and counterterrorism, Ronan Berg, uh, Bergman's Rise Up and Kill First, about Israel's uh, policy of, of targeted assassinations. Uh, it underscores two points. Firstly, the damage that's done to societies by a purely tactical response to terrorism that's, that's fought ad infinitum without any end in sight. And also, I think, strategies that rely narrowly on only one arm of the counter-terrorist arsenal, let's say decapitation, but don't consider the elements, the non-kinetic elements that you're, that you're talking about. Israel may be able to 70 years in existence afford that existence. I don't think our liberal democracies can, especially given the, the polarization that we see and the exhaustion and enervation. And that's why I think there has to be a better strategy and it has to be embraced not just by one country but across the board. And certainly the non-kinetic element you talk about is absolutely critical. But I think in years past we got so tired of just using military force 
that we thought non-kinetics alone would suffice, along with some drone attacks that eliminated the top leaders in some special, uh, special operations raids. And that, I think, has proven to, proven to be an illusion. I mean, there's not just a military solution to terrorism, but it's not completely a police problem or a non-kinetic problem. But the, the key is, I think, getting the sequencing right and then having the determination and the persistence to actually achieve the changes to ensure that the terrorists aren't able to resurface and to take advantage of discontent to once again marshal their forces and then reverse all the progress that's being made. To me, one of the, the biggest tragedies, apart from the immense, or in addition to, I should say, the immense loss of life and lives that have been ruined and shattered and the expenditure, has just been the hope of finally reversing the tide of terrorism that is constantly dashed. And we see that the victims of these attacks you know, aren't necessarily, or aren't in fact in the West, but are the inhabitants of these countries in many cases, uh, Muslims and others who are, who are forced to, who are condemned to these repeated cycles of violence that have to be broken. Um, <clears throat> we might wrap it up there because I'm cognizant that Bruce has been going since 9 a.m. this morning. Um, if you've got more questions, Bruce will be around at the bar. So please thank him again. Thank you. <clears throat> and please stick around for drinks and canapes in the bar through there. Thank you.